Hello, everyone, and welcome to Genome Startup Day. I'm Benjamin Mitchell with Phase Genomics. We're super excited about the program we have for you today and are thrilled to have so many new people joining us for the first time. Before we introduce our first guest, a quick introduction about Genome Startup Day and why we're here today. Together with our partners and generous sponsors, Phase Genomics launched Genome Startup Day in Seattle in 2019 to serve as a catalyst and community builder for those in academia look to make the leap um, to entrepreneurship. Since then, the pandemic hit and we transitioned the initiative to virtual events, which took Gen Genome Startup Day global. We've now welcomed hundreds of attendees, panelists, and featured guests from around the world. We've also brought in the vision for Genome Startup Day to not only support those looking to bridge the gap from academia to commercialization, but also to shine a spotlight on new technologies and startup founders breaking ground in the genomics and life sciences spaces. We're grateful to our sponsors, Illumina, Agilent, Twin Strand Biosciences, Watchmaker Genomics, A Alpha Bio, and SQL for enabling us to bring today's events to you at no cost. We appreciate their commitment to advancing genomics and life sciences innovation and supporting important programs like this. To get started today, we are talking about all things phages. And in just a little bit, we will be joined by three extraordinary founders working on the frontier of phage discovery and therapeutics for a special panel moderated by Juliana Lemieux of um, Genetic Engineering News, or GEN. First, I'm excited to introduce to you Ivan Liachko, founder and CEO of Phase Genomics, and Dr. Jonathan Eisen, UC Davis professor and renowned genomics and microbiology researcher for today's fireside chat. Throughout today's events, feel free to drop your questions in the stage chat, and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Those that ask questions will be eligible for some fun prizes, um, which are these genomic socks. <laughs> And we will be selecting people throughout the event to receive them. So type any of your comments or questions in the stage chat. Also join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Genome Startup Day um, for additional things that go outside of this event. Now I'll turn it over to Ivan. Thank you, Benjamin. Oh, my head is gigantic. Um, I can make thanks everyone for coming to, uh, we're very excited to do yet another um, installment of uh, Genome Startup Day. As uh, Benjamin uh, introduced you guys very well to this event, but um, just to kind of repeat a little bit of what he said, this event is a little bit different than a lot of startup events. We're really trying to focus less on sort of academic, how to build a company type stuff and more about sort of the personal nature of it. What's it like to be a startup founder? What motivates you to found, found found startups, um, what's it like to navigate the academia to sort of commercialization um, environment, what's it like to deal with professors and also company people and, um, you know, all things like that. And so we start, as always, as you can see by my fancy outfit and accessory, um, we, we are going to start with a fireside chat. I got this pipe, I got this jacket, the pipe gives me 20% more credibility in fireside chats, or maybe less, I'm not sure which way, um, one of those. Um, and uh, what I would like to do is I'd like to introduce our, our, our main guest today. So this is a person who uh, does not really need an introduction, but he's gonna get one anyway. Um, Jonathan Eisen is a professor at UC Davis. He studies evolution, ecology, genomics uh, of microbes and microbiomes. He has degrees from Harvard and Stanford. He's a naturalist. Uh, he does. He's done at least one TED talk that I saw. Maybe there's more. Um, he's editor in chief of Plus Bio. He works on um, a lot of super cool projects. He works on, um, including microbiology of the built environment, uh, seagrass microbiomes, something called the Istmo biome, which I'm assuming is the microbiome of isthmuses. Um, he is. Um, he's very decorated. He's got lots of awards, including. Uh, the Walter J. Gores Award, the Benjamin um, uh, Franklin Award, Esquire Magazine's Best and Brightest Award. He is, in fact, so renowned, he gives out his own award, uh, which is the Overselling the Microbiome Award, <laughs> which uh, he authors the uh, Overselling the Microbiome um, uh, blog, which I, I wonder what that's all about. Um, <laughs> and... Um, and, and yeah, and so, uh, so Jonathan, thank you for coming. I've wanted to have you on this for quite a while. Um, so I'm glad we got to do this. 
Glad to be here. I don't I don't have a pipe, but I do have a couch behind me. Maybe I should go sit on the, the couch that I have in my office. Yeah, it, has to, it has to be like this side. Like yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, well, so Jonathan, you heard kind of like my spiel about what we're doing here. You know, I think a lot of us who are in science and are kind of thinking about commercialization, you know, we're generally motivated by some form of passion. Like, like we love science. We want to do it. What, you know, you, you've been doing microbiology and microbiome stuff for so long. What draws you? Like, what is, what do you love about it? <laughs> well, I mean, I can tell you pretty much from a career point of view, the exact moment that I got converted over, basically. I, I in college, I was actually an East Asian studies major for a while. And then I, I was interested in biology. Both my parents were biologists, but I wasn't yet studying it. And I shifted over to biology, but I was at the time only interested in big organisms like birds. I'm obsessed with birds, as you can see from the pictures behind me. Um, and I worked on hummingbirds and then I did stuff on plants. And I was actually sort of randomly introduced to a new professor who was looking for people to help her start her lab. And because I had said I was interested in combining molecular biology and ecology, and it turns out she was doing that with microbes. She was studying, this is Colleen Cavanaugh, who's still at Harvard. Um, she was studying the two giant tube worms in the bottom of the ocean that have these bacterial symbionts that live inside of them. And at the time, and even now, nobody can grow these. So the only way to study the bacteria that lived inside these various invertebrates was to PCR amplify and sequence their ribosome RNA genes. And I was that's what I was interested in, was molecular biology and ecology. I, the time I didn't care about microbes, um, but I just, you know, the fact that there were these weird giant worms in the bottom of the ocean that had no mouth and no digestive system and lived off of bacteria that make all of their sugars and vitamins and other things for them. And they feed the bacteria sulfur. <laughs> I mean, it was just so weird, so unusual. And I just, ever since then, I've been working on microbes pretty much um, nonstop. So I went to grad school, actually, I wasn't yet fully converted. I went to grad school to work on butterflies, but that didn't work out. So I shifted to Archaea um, and uh, ever since then been only doing microbe related things. Just like slow, <laughs> closer and closer to smaller and smaller. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it is, it's very different than what I imagined because I was a naturalist and I still am. I like going out and observing organisms like butterflies and birds and plants and other things and thinking about their distribution patterns and their evolution ecology. And it's it's really, really different to do it with organisms you can't see readily. But, you know, that's what molecular biology has allowed me to do. It's not the only way to study them. But so I've accepted that I can't go out and observe the microbes directly, which is sad. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm really fascinated by their biology. I guess we're observing them in a different way now, right? With yeah. genomics, <laughs> just a different different kind of microscope. Um, you and I have talked many times about all sorts of crazy science anecdotes and projects and all sorts of things. What's your, uh, what's like your favorite project that's happening right now? I mean, there, there have been many projects that I've been involved in that are really unusual because um, I'm interested in all microbes everywhere. Uh, and partly I want to study microbes everywhere. So we've done stuff on microbes on the space station and in Antarctica and in the bottom of the ocean. Um, so, you know, the places that they live and the things that they do are sort of fascinating me. I really like extremophiles and organisms that sort of tolerate in extreme conditions. But I'll tell you, my favorite current project is one that we started about, I don't know, about 10 years ago. Um, with a collaboration with a few people, including Holly Gans, who was in my lab, and Christina Davis and David Coyle. And it involves trying to understand how um, cats do scent marking. And so um, a lot of vertebrates do scent marking. People are sort of familiar with this. And there had been studies that suggested that for hyenas, at least, the scent marking was largely enabled by microbes. That is, a hyena could mark a particular site but the individual smell of that hyena was determined largely by what microbes were on the scent producing gland. And they're converting food that the uh, hyena makes for the microbes into odors. And that way, if you have unique microbes, you get a unique individualistic scent. And that fascinated us. And we did this one little project. Uh, it's very simple. We actually literally studied a single cat 
<laughs> one individual cat that Holly Gans and collaborators got samples from the anal glands of this cat. And we took the samples, um, sent them to Christina Davis, who did volatile compound analysis, sort of metabolomics. Um, we cultured microbes from these samples, grew them up and looked at the volatiles that they produced in culture. And we sequenced the microbial community to try and understand what microbes were present in the original sample. And we basically found a single microbe that we could culture from this sample that was relatively abundant in the sample. And it produced in the lab, in fact, you could smell it. It smelled like cat butt when it was growing in the lab. Um, and it produced volatile compounds that were also found in the samples from the anal gland from this cat. Now that didn't prove that microbes were doing this for that individual cat, but it was really interesting. And now I have a postdoc in my lab, Connie Rojas, who is following this up. She's been collaborating with someone in our vet school um, who has helped her get samples from about 20 cats now. Um, and she's been doing culturing, metagenomics now, rather than ribosome RNA sequencing. Um, and we're working again with Christina Davis to look at the volatile compounds. And we, we think that it's just a really interesting area, the sort of animal scent production that gives animals an individualistic identifiable odor. But not surprisingly, people, people are covered in microbes, animals are covered in microbes. Those microbes can contribute to their unique uh, smell. So, you know, we love this because it's weird and it's cat butts and, you know, <laughs> cats are interesting. So, you know, people are, when you talk to people about it, they're like, oh yeah, that sounds really, you know, interesting. Mm -hmm. And it has relevant to your topic here. It has lots of potential commercial applications um, in a variety of ways. So it's just uh, hybridizes all sorts of cool, interesting things about microbes, but also is really good for communication, discussing it um, and, it's fun. That actually preempts my next question. What's the yeah. next big thing in the space? And it's it's cat butt smells, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And fun fact, I mean, you know this, but the audience might not. We actually did some work with Holly and your uh, team on a celebrity cat where we did microbiome sequencing of Little Bub, the yeah. celebrity YouTube cat. It's very cute. I recommend you guys all research Little Bub. It's very cute. Yeah. And Holly, Holly actually left my lab and started a company, Animal Biome, which I am an advisor to, that is focused more on you know, cat and dog health related to microbes, but we still have these projects like the celebrity cat. And we ran a citizen science project called Kitty Biome, where we had people send in cat poop, just like the human gut microbiome studies, but this time with cats. And actually a paper was just submitted on that um, like last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good. It was great. Um, I actually needed that information, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Uh, yes, and we did a thing, and we did. We, ours was called Meow Crow Biome. So, uh, yeah. Meow Crow Biome. Anyway, so uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, let me let me try to steer back to. Um, so, you know, I was kind of thinking, like, what do you think is the next big thing in the space? Like, um, but you know, obviously, we're thinking like commercially. Um, you know, we're we're thinking a lot about microbiome, like therapeutics. We're thinking a lot about phages and phage therapeutics. Where do you see the field moving? kind of like, you know, diverging between sort of academia and industry? Well, I mean, you, you sort of hinted at this before in that I give out this award. Um, I haven't given it out as much during the pandemic, but I, um, I feel that many people for many years and even today have been overselling the microbiome in a lot of different ways. And that, that doesn't mean that I don't think it's important and interesting. I think it is absolutely, the, so microbiome is communities of microbes. And they clearly play important roles in the health and well-being of humans and various plants and animals and ecosystems and other things. The challenge and where I think the direction that it, things are going right now, the challenge is that, that they're really, really hard to study. So you have, you know, like on a human, um, you have different microbes on the elbow, then on the forehead, then in your mouth, then in your gut, then, you know, in various other orifices and in places, every individual changes over time in response to health status and diet and travel and um, people differ from each other and it relates a little bit to genetics and a little bit to history and I mean, it's, and there are thousands of taxa in many samples and each of those common tens to hundreds of different genotypes. I mean, it's just, it's incredibly complicated and trying to figure out like what the functions of these microbes might be and how a host like a human could control those microbes, which in fact they don't a lot of the time 
that's a lot of the overselling. So like, that's just really hard. And what's exciting is that people are finally getting a handle on the functional contributions of some of these microbes in a really more detailed way. And, you know, related to phage therapy, we don't do a lot on viruses, but many people are also trying to do microbiome therapy to manipulate microbial communities with sort of engineering principles and other things. And those things are finally starting to gain traction where you can actually say, I am going to try to increase the amount of this particular type of microbe. And that turns out to be very hard. You can't just give people probiotics with microbes. They usually just die. Um, I mean, sometimes they work, but they, it's very challenging as the phage therapy people have also, I'm sure, discovered. It's, these are ecosystems and they have very complicated dynamics and they're very hard to work on. But the thing that I'm most excited about is the attempts to actually, um, through chemical means or microbial introduction means or prebiotic that is introducing food or adding viruses or other things into systems to start to manipulate the communities. And, you know, in humans, I still think that that is incredibly difficult because, you know, humans don't listen. They have diverse diets. They have all, everybody has a different immune history and it's even hard in inbred strains of mice that are genetically identical and have the same immune history and the same diet and other things. So humans are maybe the last frontier. I think we'll see a lot of effective stuff in agriculture, in um, model organisms and in other, you know, organisms that you can manipulate a little more readily than in humans. But without a doubt, there's lots of interesting stuff happening in the human arena. Yeah, no, cool. I mean, I also think that I sort of noticed the, um, I'm hoping that the the selling to overselling ratio in the microbiome space has been moving in the right direction. I think a lot of the early promises have been kind of called away. And I think we're becoming, people are a little more skeptical and we're kind of really, um, and the technology progressed too. So we can actually start making, you know, more realistic improvements and kind of a little bit less overselling and more uh, making legit kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> legit technology. Yeah, I mean, the the I'm not sure the overselling is going down, but the legit stuff is going up. Yeah, well, <laughs> so. there's two ways to impact the ratio, right? <laughs> right, so, yeah, cool. And so, so again, so, you know, the we're talking about startups and kind of commercialization and trying to introduce, you know, so a, lot of, a lot of our audience are students, you know, who are maybe thinking about it or they're nearby. So you mentioned Holly. Holly start, founded Animal Biome. And... Um, I don't know if you have other startups out of your lab, but like, what was that like? That must have been different than most of your other interactions, right? I mean, it, you know, I was not heavily involved. So, I mean, Holly would be the person to talk to because it was really, she took business classes and um, she learned about startups and then, you know, did all of it herself. I was a very peripheral advisor. I've been actually more involved in some other um companies previously. And I, it's funny, you, you asked sort of, and you, you asked me some questions, showed me some questions in advance, and I've been thinking about this. I just have never, there are many people in academia that think that the corporate world is like a, a, a wall that you should not cross or like maybe cross only occasionally. I've never felt that way. And I've never sort of viewed it that way. And actually, when I was a graduate student, I had a postdoc lined up at Berkeley. And then I met Craig Venter at a, at a dinner and I eventually got offered a faculty job at his genome place called Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research. It was before, like a couple months before he started Solera. So I actually never worked for him because he left before I got there. But I had this offer from Tiger and many of my colleagues were like, you can't do this. You'll never come back to academia if you go to a company. And first of all, Tiger was this weird, it wasn't, it was a nonprofit research institute. So it wasn't a for-profit place. But so many people were like, you can't, don't do this. You're never going to return. And I was like, first of all, I was like, so who the fuck, oh, excuse me, who cares? Um, uh, it, like, I, what, I just want to do something interesting. And they are li literally leading the genomics revolution at the time. And then I asked the people I really trusted. So I asked um, David Cox, who had started Perligen. I don't know if he had started Perligen yet, but he was at the Stanford Human Genome Center. And he was like, don't listen to any of them. They're crazy. As if you do something interesting while you're there, you can always return. Like, 
Like if it, sure, if you go there and you don't do anything interesting and you have nothing to tell people of your time at a company, that's going to be hard to possibly return to academia. But he's like, there's no worry about it if you actually do interesting things. And so I've never really sort of viewed it as like there are these sort of barriers. I mean, I know there are ethical things that you need to worry about. And so like with the companies that I've been, been involved in, we've had to set up all sorts of layers to um, prevent conflicts of interest um, associated with the companies. And I think those are all reasonable, but from a like do or don't do this point of view, I never really understood the, the sort of fear mongering that many in academia had said about working at a company or advising a company or, you know, starting a company. Yeah, no, it's really good. I mean, I was hoping to kind of get your like, cause you know, a lot of the folks who are listening, you know, they're, they don't know what the professors are going to do. They are worried. Right. I mean, it's one thing also to be, you know, well-established faculty and go and then try it and come back. But if you're like a, a student or a postdoc, the, you're much more worried about the risk. Right. And so trying to get like a, like if a student or a postdoc was trying to start a company, like, you as a professor, like, how should they approach you? I mean, granted, you're probably more open-minded about these things as the most, but like, what are, what would you think at least some kind of do's and don'ts um, for someone who is, who is thinking about jumping into this? Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the you know, they, what I learned sort of from Holly and from other people that I was close to who started companies is, um, or, you know, tried to start companies is it, it's not like something you just do. I mean, there was a lot of learning involved in all the things about financing and all the things about, you know, how you actually think about it and what your long-term versus short-term strategies are. And we don't think about those types of things in academia generally. So I think that there, it's certainly worth um, learning a lot about that before you jump in um, immediately and say, I'm just going to go start a company. Where do I register, you know, my my corporate identity to? Um, and, you know, there are now back back when I was first thinking about this, there weren't as many of the incubator spaces. But now I think it's really useful to talk to some of the people associated with some of the incubator spaces. I mean, there are, there are a lot of them. They're, you know, all different and um, but it, it's certainly helpful to think about not doing it totally on your own. So when, when I've interacted with students, like graduate students or postdocs who have thought about this, I mean, I point them to like, there's a little workshop at our business school that talks about this. They have these two day workshops that I think are absolutely worth going to and thinking about. And, you know, be, be prepared to, if you have not been associated with a startup, they're a very different type of life um you know than than academia um so you have to be prepared for it to be really different and be willing to be out there dangling i guess a little bit yeah. um but the part that i think is really important is it doesn't shut any doors um and and even if you're there for five years and you haven't you know can't report you can't tell people what you did it still doesn't completely shut doors so i think it's okay to take a risk and go do something different and um, explore it. But I, I think going in with your eyes wide open and really doing some research about how it works, because I've never had to do that. I have not actually left uh, full time to start a company. I've advised people on the science mostly. And when I see the business part of it, it it's hard. And it's not something that is trivial to figure out. And it's definitely worth making sure that you think about it. Yeah, the little um, little cheat that I tell people when they're thinking about it and they're worried about how the professor will react is really encourage them to think about what is motivating them. And it's usually impact and wanting to make a bigger splash scientifically and, and just be like, talk about that. Yeah. Like if you go and you're like, hey, I'm tired of making a stipend. I want a bunch of money. So I'm going to found a startup like that's not going to necessarily yeah. be a correct or be uh, sway anyone to your to your side. But if you say, look, we have this amazing invention. I just want to see it explode and go big. Like, I think people will support you. And uh, not a lot of people will kind of push push back against that sort of. Mentality. Yeah. But, and, uh, and it's field specific. Right. I mean, like. I, I traverse many fields in genomics. It's not that unusual in ecology and evolution. It's 
It's definitely right. less common. Um, so you have to sort of figure out what to talk about to people depending upon in chemistry. I mean, it's a routine thing. So, And at its heart, entrepreneurship is really about change. It's about bringing something new or changing the way people do things, you know, um, and that's always kind of scary, you know. And academia is reluctant to change, academia, right? I mean, so, so academia yeah. is about as slow moving, it's, conservative, it's, you know, from a change point of view, not political necessarily, but. We'll wear the robes from like the Renaissance yeah. with the hats and everything. It's yeah. all about like, like, yeah, it's all about sort of ancient ways. Of yeah, let's talk about scientific publishing sometime. Oh. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, that, that'll be the next you know, start of it. Um, what do you think? So um, what are the biggest pitfalls that you think or maybe mistakes that kind of pre-founders or early stage founders make, um, at least that you've seen, that you would like caution somebody against? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the number one mistake is not really to, that i've seen is not really whatever you want to call it but but getting a red team or really bashing whatever technology or approach that you're thinking about and making sure that it is first of all as novel as you think it is if you think that that's what your basis is going to be that nobody else is doing it because lots of people are doing lots of things um and is it going to work in the way you think it's going to work? Because I've seen a lot of places that, you know, they published some paper that showed some finding that seemed like it could be commercialized. But, you know, papers have lots of mistakes in them. Um, and just because it got through peer review at some snooty journal does not mean that it's perfect. Um, so I've seen a lot of cases of places that I've been an advisor to or friends that have done things that, they ended up struggling be because they had not really figured out all the nooks and crannies of good and bad about the thing that they were working on. I think that that's the first thing that I would tell people. And it's just not, we don't do that in academia in the same way. Like if you get things through to the publication, you're like, oh, I, I did it, it must be right. Or, or at least it's close enough to, um, and I think the other, the other thing that um, I've seen a lot of, which, you know, is also true in academia is, you know, surround yourself with people that are both that you, you can work with, you don't have to like them necessarily perfectly, but that you can work with, but that also are willing to be on it. Like, like you need people who aren't just going to suck up and say good things about everything. You need people that are really going to push the envelope of like, when is this broken? Let's figure it out. Let's do things. And, and in, you know, that seems like I've seen places go wrong when there's one like charismatic mega leader and nobody telling them that stuff isn't working. Yep. Yeah. No, that's yeah. I think good communication teams. We always talk on these things about how important team is. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I would even say that one of the things that people don't do is that they keep themselves shut or they think, oh, if somebody knows about my idea, then it's all gone. And you're like, no, it's more important to build a team and have people who know yeah. what they're talking about than to hide your little thing, um, uh, you know, within legal limits and patents and stuff. But like, but in general, you know, talk to people and find both critical voices and encouraging voices because you need a balance of both. You do need a little bit of kind of like reckless abandon to do this, yeah. um, but also, you know, temper that with reality and things like that. Yeah. Cool. Well, we talked for about half an hour, so I'm going to get ready to introduce the next the panel with the startups. Do you have any parting thoughts, Jonathan, like anything you want to say to the audience or the people or? No, I mean, you hinted at this, but I mean, I think the number one thing that I always seems to be associated with the people who do this well is if you love it, like, I mean, if, whether it's the topic or the activity that you're doing or something like the more that you actually love that topic or that thing that you're doing, the more likely you are to figure out when things go wrong, how to fix them. It's just like the the old saying: If you love what you do, you will work every day for the rest of your life without. Exactly. Work. Yes. <laughs> so cool. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks again um, for coming. It was yeah, really sure. good to see you. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll see if there's any follow-up. I'm going to learn about some phage now. But, yeah, let's talk to some phage people. Before we do that, we are going to do the thing we always do, and we're going to give away DNA socks. Our um, our amazing DNA sock winner today is. Check's phone. 
Elizabeth Stewart. Come on down virtually, of course, because I can't see you or have any way to interact with you. But uh, you're <laughs> Elizabeth Stewart. You want some socks. And, um, and then now I'm going to introduce, we're going to start our, uh, our next session. Um, <laughs> yet. Benjamin is going to connect me with, with, our, with our moderator. Yes. Hi, Ivan. So I would like to introduce our amazing moderator, Juliana Lemieux. Uh, Juliana is a senior science writer at GEN. Uh, she covers synthetic biology, genomics, infectious disease, genome editing, and more. Um, she has a PhD in molecular biology and microbiology from Tufts. Um, she's got over 15 years of you know, experience in scientific research and education um, with a specialization in infectious disease. She's a microbiology instructor at City College in, in New York. I didn't even know that. That's that's some Twitter sleuthing. <laughs> but uh, Juliana is awesome. We know all sorts of uh, interactions. So I'm very happy to have her. She's actually she's moderated uh, an episode of GSD before, and uh, she was so good at it. We had to have her back. And so Juliana, I'll pass the torch to you, and um, let you talk to the startups. And I'll see you guys in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Thanks for the introduction. Um, that was very kind. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here today at Genome Startup Day um, for my second time um, with you and, and Jonathan and with this incredible panel that's representing some really exciting and innovative phage startups. So before we jump into asking them questions, I want to introduce our three panelist experts. They are Nathan Brown, CSO and co-founder at Parallel Health, Mimi Yen, CEO and co-founder at Phage Pro, and Jessica Satcher, co-founder of Phage Directory. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Oh, I guess we can talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, and before we get started, I want to remind our audience that we would also like to answer your questions for our panelists. So please put your questions into the comments section of the platform. So to start, I'll ask each panelist to tell us about themselves and their companies, starting with Jessica from Phage Directory. Thank you, yeah. Hi, it's so fun to be here. This is one of my favorite topics crossed with my other favorite topic, startups from academia and phages. So, Page Directory, we started as a side project, basically matchmaking service between doctors and researchers, researchers who had phages, because doctors needed phages and they didn't know where to go. And they were using Twitter to just spam the ether to try to hopefully find life-saving treatment. So that was the catalyst. And now we're working with a team in Australia um, to, they were doing a clinical trial and we're helping build systems to kind of source phages for them, but also make the whole process of personalized phage therapy easier. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Jessica. And Mimi, what's going on at Phage Pro? Sure. So hi, everyone. Um, Phage Pro started as a tough spin out. So actually with the, the same lab that Juliana came from, Andrew Camilli's lab, and we work on how to use phages to prevent cholera and disrupt household transmission. And where we're pivoting towards now is how do we take all of that knowledge and start to develop infrastructure and capacity building in emerging markets like Africa and Asia and have that be built in parallel with product development for our resource limited settings. Okay, wow, terrific. And Nathan, what's happening at Parallel Health? Yeah, well, we started about two years ago. Um, it was a dream and a team. Um, my co-founder, Natalie Scalia Robinson, who has a background in business, and I worked together before in another phage startup. <laughs> we started this one with the vision of um, really bringing personalized um, cosmetics to the market through phages and through uh, shotgun metagenomics applied to the skin. So the skin microbiome and bringing those two technology together. So that's, that's our mission. <laughs> okay. All right, great. I mean, what a diverse group of, I mean, just showing all the different ways that phages can be used. Um, so terrific, we'll get a nice broad look at phages today. Um, so, okay, focusing a bit, we're gonna focus a bit on phages first and kind of 
you know, what you're all doing. And then we'll talk about starting up a company a little bit later um, in the half hour. So Nathan, can you tell me a bit more about that business model and more generally, you know, the different ways that people are monetizing phages? Sure. Yeah. I mean, since the beginning, the discovery of phages in the early 20th century, Felix Rahel immediately knew that these would be good as medicine. Right. And so he treated some patients with different early on, should have worked as a drug. And pretty much since then, people have been focused on that. Um, but um, there have been some other applications of phages and other ways of monetizing them. For example, um, one of the first phage companies um, in the West or in the United States is Intralytics, which is still around. It was founded in 1999. And they use phages as food additives, not as drugs. And so given the number of problems that bacteria cause and that phage can remove bacteria, there's also a number of, of, of um, um, solutions that phage can offer besides just being drugs. So they're used in agriculture to treat agricultural diseases and that sort of thing. So I think when you talk about monetizing phages, you really want to look at all the possible um, problems that bacteria cause in the world, um, including things like bizarre things like um, uh, rusting oil pipes, right? So this can be accelerated by bacteria. And so if you use a phage to, to address that, you might be able to, to slow the rust. So, so there's all kinds of bizarre applications. Hmm. Okay, terrific. Um, and Mimi, going to back to Phage Pro for a second, I know that we use the term phage therapy a lot for treating infections, you know, that have already set up in a person. Um, but I think that you're hoping to use phages in more of like a prophylactic or preventative way. So can you talk a little bit about that and what's the difference? Yeah, so I think this gets back to almost like a philosophical question about public health versus medicine, where when we're thinking about low and middle income countries, which have a limited budget, where are they going to get the most bang for their buck? It is in prevention, which is not sexy. It's not something that you can show immediately that it works because if it's working, you don't see the disastrous outcome of it. But it's also the most affordable way to make sure you're controlling outbreaks before they happen. So for us, especially with cholera, where it's a diarrheal disease and these clinics usually don't have a uh, way of actually isolating the bacteria to give you the etiological agent, the best way to treat cholera is rehydration, just like any other diarrheal disease. And phages are so specific. So really you're relying on um, tried and true clinical practices to treat cholera. And the most need is controlling the outbreak, which is where phages can really come in handy and disrupt household um, transmission and prevent an outbreak from spreading once you already confirm that it's there on a population level. So I think that's where we want to aim a lot of our efforts because ultimately on a whole, it'll save that government and those people um, a lot more lives and a lot more money by focusing upstream rather than downstream. Mm. Okay, yeah, so interesting. Um, Jessica, so we know that certain areas of biotech are being hit hard by the current economic climate. So how do you think that's impacted the phage field specifically? Oh, sorry, Jessica, I think you're muted. Sorry, sorry. I thought I might get this question. Um, no, it's interesting how the whole climate is impacting things. First, the post-COVID situation that we're in, I think, has helped um, everybody realize what a pandemic means, what infectious disease can mean what, how much it can disrupt our lives. Like we couldn't have really been given a better gift, even though that's a terrible way to look at it. But you know, to the phage field, because we were kind of up, going uphill, swimming upstream on those conversations. I think a lot of us, because um, you know, infectious disease isn't something you hear about, like cancer. You know, everybody you know, everybody knows somebody you know with cancer, but not really. Do you know anyone who's had an antibiotic resistant infection or like? suffered from anything related to infectious disease a lot most people would say no but now they don't so that's pretty big and um the other so more funding is presumably trickling into infectious diseases um but the other thing with startups i think in the downturn economically i it's i think of it as like a time for a really good time to work on startups because you can kind of work on them in peace there's not as much going on it's not as like frothy and it's like you read about this in kind of the Silicon Valley based like tech startup world a lot where 
like the the low economic downturn is when like the good startups really have time to build and build what they're gonna be bringing to the world instead of focusing on like oh no there's all this money sloshing around we better go raise money and so you you end up focusing a lot so we're just happy that we can build in peace but um if you need a lot of money to do the building that's that's harder <laughs> yeah yeah okay and um to mimi or nathan really I mean, we know that phages have been around forever, but also, you know, there are hurdles that the industry is going to have to get over to get phages being used in routine practice, whether it's drugs or cosmetics. How do you think about, you know, in your companies getting over, getting over those hurdles to either one of you or both? Nathan, do you want to start with the cosmetic side and then I could talk about the FDA sure. side? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for cosmetics, um, there's technical challenges, which I'll let Min Min discuss. Um, she has those too. Um, everyone in this field does. But for cosmetics, there's a unique challenge, and that is you need to convince consumers to buy it. <laughs> so how do you how do you educate the consumer about phages, and um, how do you talk about them, and how do you make an attractive proposition to buy them, um, and how do you work with them after they use them? How do you um, provide customer support, that sort of thing is all very, very important. Um, and we kind of look at our mission as unique in the phage field because we get the opportunity, which I'm really excited about with, with the help of my co-founder, who's experienced direct to consumer marketing, um, to introduce the public to phages. And that's exciting. So um, that's a challenge and an opportunity that we're really passionate about. Yeah, I would echo that one of the hardest things, especially for like convincing physicians and convincing regulatory agencies, stakeholders, is making sure that phage as a new modality is worth them putting their time in and investigating. Um, so that remains true for the drug um, use of phages as well. I think the US FDA has been incredibly open um, for this new modality and very transparent about communication in terms of how do you get uh, approval to start a clinical trial if you're doing a phage therapy because there is no official guidance. So it requires a lot more communication with regulatory authorities than more established modalities, I think. And then the second challenge is it's always manufacturing. And I think we've come a long way there. And um, Jess could probably speak to this more, but manufacturing is always going to be top of mind. And now with the pandemic, understanding like how supply chain is going to be disrupted and all of that, these manufacturing facilities aren't just going to be used for phages, they're used for other drugs as well. And then there's nuances with phages um, that you don't have with other modalities that people have to now learn. Um, on the manufacturing side and at a scaled up value to be able to provide phages to a huge population versus just growing it up in the academic lab for an individual patient. Um, so I think those would be the two um, main hurdles that you would have to overcome, but the field has come a long way in both of those. And I think it's because the community is so tight. We do talk to each other a lot to make sure that we're exchanging best practices. And phage directory is actually a huge part of that. So I'm sure Jess can speak to that aspect a little bit more. Um, yeah, thank you, Mimi. Um, yeah, I think you touched on a lot of it. And definitely when we were building up the community side of phage directory, which I didn't talk about too much, but we have 80, two countries worth of sage people kind of coming to the same place online nowadays and looking what we have a newsletter that goes out and a bunch of community efforts there but our main thing is the phage alert system so all these phage labs around the world actually respond to ur urgent alerts when anybody a company or a lab has a need for a phage that they don't have um, so they can get it from the community but um I think, yeah, that's like, we really wanted to foster a communal watering hole to exchange these kind of insights and figure out what are the actual hurdles. And yeah, that's where it kind of became really clear that like, okay, manufacturing is a hurdle across the board. And um, now it's just so much easier now that we're kind of all communicating a lot more, especially um, now that it's virtual communication has become so normal. It's like, it's just infinitely easier to figure out like, okay, 
has someone solved this problem? Has someone not solved it? Is this an actual problem for the whole field? And then you can just go from there. So yeah, we're just like knocking down bottlenecks and hurdles like one after the other as a field, I think. So that's really cool. Okay, awesome. Um, so it's Genome Startup Day. And so now I want to transition a little bit into talking about starting up a company. Um, so a little bit away from Phage, although of course we'll still talk about Phages. So um, Mimi, I'm wondering why did you want to start a company and what motivated you to start a company in Phage? <laughs> I get asked this question a lot because people are like, oh, did you want to be an entrepreneur Why? as a baby? <laughs> like, no, I definitely did not want to be an entrepreneur. I did not think I had any business sense at all. Um, so I started this company because the science was so compelling. Um, this was part of my PhD work in the Camilli lab. We did an animal model and it was so... Um, had so much potential. And also when we presented it to other people, it was exciting, but no one really wanted to take it forward. It's cholera. It's not something that people want to invest a lot of time into from like a biotech investor perspective. Um, even though there's a lot of great people in the field and a lot of great public health people working on this, um, like Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust and all of that, there's no one in biotech that is really putting a lot of effort into cholera. And certainly at the time, there was only a handful of page companies and many of them were targeting a lot of the top 10 AMR um, pathogens. So for me, it just felt like there's no one else who has the conviction to do it. So I'm gonna do it. Um, I was very naive. <laughs> it's really hard uh, starting a company. Um, and I think what motivated me to start it in the phage space is I think, as I talked about a little bit earlier, phage therapy is at a very interesting tipping point where there isn't any, or there is starting to be budding infrastructure from the drug development side, but a lot of it is focused in the US and Europe. And when I think about access to medicine and the opportunity with, that we can have, to start thinking about phage therapy infrastructure building in Africa and Asia where the AMR burden is highest and the appetite for phage is arguably also highest. I think the field has a unique opportunity to tackle access to medicine um, from in the AMR space from a different way. And that's what gets me really excited about having a company in the phage space in emerging markets in particular. Okay, awesome. And um, so Nathan, I think you did your PhD, was it Oregon State University? Uh -huh. Okay, so my question is, you know, what is different, would you say, um, about working in a company or an industry than, you know, working in academia? Okay, instantly what comes to mind is the kind of experiments you can do. So you'd think that you don't do experiments in a company, but you do. In fact, a whole company's an experiment, right? And that's, I mean, that's a fun playground, really. Um, you can experiment with all kinds of things in a company. Um, and uh, so, for example, you know, at our company, um, at the Illumin Accelerator, where we got our start, we were able to do a very large scale study for, for a group our size. And we were able to collect samples from the skin microbiome from uh, between 400 and 500 people. Um, just because we were able to quickly raise the capital to do that and, and getting the grant money to do that would be difficult. They'd probably expect you to do some sort of um, pilot study that's much smaller scale, but you can hit the ground running really fast in a company if you can attract the, the capital. And so the scale of experiments you can do is, is, is dramatically different between the two. Although I do realize that big science is done in academia it takes large, um, large collaboration to do everything, so. Yeah, and I should say, Mimi and Jessica, feel free to chime in if you have, um, you know, a different perspective or something to, to add to, um, you know, what, what was different for you, maybe in a company versus academia. Yeah, it's, um, I think, I agree. I really like the comment, like the company is an experiment. That's like the big thing I feel is like the entire, not just what you're doing is, you know, make up what you want to do and figure out what you're going to do. But like the structure of how you're doing it 
make up how you want to do that. So it's like academia or any real company like that exists already is going to have these structures in place and startup. It's like, you could do anything. And I think it took me a while and it's still taking me a while to really understand what that means. Cause I, I think I tend to, um, try to like see patterns in other places and, and glom onto these tracks and be like, okay, we're going to be like them. And like, oh, they're raising investment. Okay, what does it take to do that? And it's like, wait, does that make sense for our little niche and what we're doing? So you can you can be a small company, you can, you can expand and grow, you can like focus on having all your own in-house lab stuff or, and then you have to raise more money or you can focus on like, you know, contracting out different things and stay very, very small and lean. And like, you can constantly reevaluate that. So yeah, having the actual structure, like your meta version of your life is, is also kind of in flux and an experiment is kind of wild. <laughs> so Jessica, let me ask you, um, what skills have you learned along the way that you did not have before you started a company? Um, yeah, I think the first thing that came to mind for this is like note taking, which is sad, but I didn't write anything down before, like comparatively for when I was doing research, it was all just me. I didn't have to like explain it to anybody else, cut my PI and I could just verbally tell her. And I thought I was taking notes and documenting what I was doing, but I wasn't like, I, that's like the big thing I learned, like documenting, like conversations you have with people like, okay, I met with this person, like add it to like a, a little database of meeting notes. And I I learned all this from my co-founder who did know about these things. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? Next time we meet with them, we need to know what was said. And I'm like, oh yes, we should. <laughs> so things like, it just feels because you're the, the buck stops with you and there's no one else other than maybe if you have co-founders, but like you have to, everything you do and everything you think of and like decisions that you make and why it's like you're gonna forget why you made those decisions so just like the practice of like creating like a little world and like keeping track i i didn't do that before really and i don't think that comes up a lot um but that's what i learned and then can maybe pass it over to the others but i have like a long list of these things that are just like getting organized <laughs> yeah well, actually, I want to also we have some great questions coming in from the audience. So, um, Mimi, let me ask you, this is a question from Crystal. Can you share a piece of advice you received early on that had the biggest impact in helping you shape the beginning of your founder's journey? Yeah, um, I think the biggest piece of advice is don't be afraid to try and don't be afraid of the rejection. Because I think when we're doing startups, there's so much risk, personal risk. There's so much, um, uh, people call it bravery. For me, it was probably like me being naive. Um, but there's a lot that goes into doing a startup and people are going to tell you no the whole way. Um, you're going to hear no's from investors. You're going to hear no from people who think like, why are you even doing this startup? This is not like a stable life path for you. <laughs> like, why did you, why are you taking a lower salary for all of this? Um, and I think this goes back to a little bit of the, the fireside chat earlier. Like if you really have a passion for starting something and you think you're the only one who's going to take it forward, don't be afraid to try and don't be afraid of the no because it's much better to try it out and fail and learn from that failure than to have never tried it at all. And then the, you would never make the impact that you would have made um, if you did succeed at your startup. So I think that's the biggest piece of advice. I think as scientists, we're all really used to rejection, usually by science, <laughs> but um, being able to handle a lot of that rejection and still believe in the conviction that you are the right person to take this forward um, has really stayed with me. All right. Terrific advice. Yeah, that was great. Um, I want to stick with you for a second, Mimi, because um, there are some institutions and I mean, even individual labs that are really well known for spinning out companies. Um, you know, it's part of their culture. Um, but as you already mentioned, you and I are both fortunate enough to have been trained in the Camille Lab at Tufts. And at least 
when I was there um, quite a while ago, this was actually not part of the culture. I, I think it's probably um, changed a little bit. But can you tell us a little bit about how, if you're not in that type of environment, how you can find support or mentors, um, you know, that that to seek those out or like, how do you, how do you make your own support group if, if it's not kind of right there for you in an incubator space or something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one part of it is getting out of your comfort zone. So when I did the, so we started because Tufts did this hundred K entrepreneurship competition and they came to our campus, but I was the only one there at the info session. So they were trying to start up this entrepreneurial ecosystem, but clearly like it wasn't cultivated yet, even though they were putting the effort into it. Um, so I had to really step outside my comfort zone and go to people who are like in the entrepreneurial center and go up to them and try to explain my science, try to explain my ideas and see if I can convince anyone that this was worth pursuing or worth like exchanging ideals with and the more people you talk to along the way and the more you put yourself out there you start to get a little bit of a following or a little bit of advice from each person and you cultivate those relationships and ultimately you kind of find your people who are going to be there with you that whole way um and i'm lucky right i am at tufts where it's starting to become more entrepreneurial but i'm also based in boston um, and Boston is all about incubating biotech. So I was able to go out into my city and find all these other events and just Google search <laughs> for things that I didn't know that I needed to know. Um, and I think that's the hard part of it. You just have to keep trying and knocking on doors and telling people what your story is and changing your story sometimes on the feedback to finally find your people that will champion you. And um, I think in the phage space, um, it, what has been great about that community, and this is why I credit um, Justin Yan so much with Phage Directory, is that we kind of found each other through, and we're starting up our companies at the same time, and we're able to support each other through the startup time. Um, so it really is all about finding the right connections, but you have to put yourself out there a lot, which is hard for an introvert like me, but I, it will happen. <laughs> Okay, terrific. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of people in the audience with greater ideas who are interested and inspired in starting their own companies. So Nathan, what should they do first? Find a co-founder. <laughs> get a co-founder. <laughs> and if you're a scientist, get a business person <laughs> because it isn't trivial. And um, there's a little bit of Dunning-Kruger, Dunning I think, in science about business because they're just we're just not aware of how, you know, it's kind of looked down on what I feel. We're just not aware of the challenges that are there. And if you get a good um, business-minded co-founder, even a scientist who shifted over and picked up those functions, um, it's going to make your life so much easier. Oh, boy. Yeah. So do that. <laughs> Okay, great advice. Jessica, any advice on what, what they should do first? What's what's like their first move? Yeah, um, I think go find startup meetups in your city. So a lot of cities, especially if you're in any of the big cities these days, everyone's trying to get, get like a startup ecosystem. And sometimes it's around universities or incubators. Like if you're lucky enough to be in Boston, like you do not have to go far. And I I'm jealous of you, Mimi, being there <laughs> sometimes. But um, I've been in cities even like as small as Calgary and then Atlanta and now Sydney. And all of these are like big cities, but small and they don't really have a huge scene. But I can still, everywhere I go, I just like look up like for, you know, where are the startup people meeting? And a lot of these, even though they're not like biotech meetups, they won't be focused on bio. But there will, like, you'll show up there and be like, hey, I work in bio. And there'll be so many people who have all the other skills that you mentioned, Nathan, that you really need. And they'll be like, wow. And you'll be, like, the coolest person there because everybody wishes they had, like, a cool thing to work on. And all these people I found at these startup meetups that are more general, they're like, yeah. oh, I don't want to, you know, build a, like, social media, like, tool add-on. Like, they... they <laughs> they would love the chance to work with a scientist. And so like, that's what you should do. Just like Google, find in your city and go to one and go to one every month. 
and just keep going and you'll eventually find friends you'll find a co-founder it will be organic you don't have to like cold email someone that would be ridiculous i think <laughs> just go meet friends and like learn about what startups are like that's you could do that in any city i think now where did you and jan meet jessica was it a dance Yes, group or? Uh, yeah, swing dancing. So it was not anything mm -hmm. to do with startups. And so I would never mm -hmm. have like bridged into this world if not for him. And he just like happened to have that background, had worked on a couple startups. And so, yeah, you need like one friend who knows about startups. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Okay. So, and I'll ask this and this where we unfortunately need to wrap up. Um, I know we could talk about this all, all night, but um, I'll ask each of you in like a lightning round. Just what's been the best thing about like since you started your company, Jessica? I want to end uh, on a positive. I, yeah, getting to do like something that is actually going to make a difference, and you get to reevaluate that like every day. That's very. You can keep keep refocusing and like go for the mission. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Nathan. Working with my awesome co-founder, I love it so so much fun. Okay, terrific, Mimi. Same as Jessica, it's the impact that you get and you're building and creating and you're always, you're visualizing your dream. And that's what you're working yeah. on when you're in a startup. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Well, that brings us to the end of our discussion. Um, I wanna thank all of you for um, sharing all of this today and just having a great discussion. And I wanna thank our audience at Genome Startup Day. Um, I think, that we might have Benjamin coming in to close the show, or if not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me get y'all off of here real fast. Um, just to repeat that, thank you so much to all of our speakers for coming and joining us in our Genome Startup Day event series. Um, for one more SAC giveaway, we have one more winner, and that is Rami Aziz. Uh, Rami and also Elizabeth, you'll be getting emails soon. Um, so thank you so much for participating and coming to this event. Uh, today's event is coming to a close, but it will continue on social media. So you may follow us at um, on Twitter at Genome Startup or LinkedIn Genome Startup Day. Um, for some follow-up content, relevant news, and notifications about the next events. Thank you all so much for coming and have a great rest of your week.